Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the 5 to 9 album of the month podcast. You may notice, uh, if you're, you've seen the podcast before, that there's only uh, the two of us today. Um, unfortunately, editor Andrew Belt could not make this episode, so we're having a cheers and sending him uh, well wishes as he works through his backlog of work. Uh, we hope he'll be back for the next episode. But today you've got uh, myself, Carl Blakesley from uh, New Music Central, and you've got uh, Kylie Larson from Mama Manana Records. Kylie, how are you doing? I'm, I'm doing well. I feel uh, a little little out of sorts without Andrew here, but yeah. Uh, you like know, it's at a leg. <laughs> yeah, we're, yeah, we're missing a leg, a, a limb at least. And, uh, you know, maybe the brains of the entire operation, I'm not sure. But uh, yeah, this this is a, a good month for the two of us to just catch up here because uh, I think the three of us have had plenty of discussion getting to this day about these five albums. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, if you think back to last month, uh, I think we all agreed that July was the tough one. And we'll see if this July follows. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, d- definitely it's, you know, July typically we see a drop off in terms of the releases that come out into it certainly in terms of some of the big ones we have managed to pull five together um for this one but before we get into those five records obviously we'll kick things off as we always do what's been your kind of musical highlight outside of the five albums uh for this month yeah i think outside of these these five albums the choice choices overall um Still wasn't a bunch, but there was a few things that uh, I really enjoyed this month. Uh, the first being the return of uh, Sturgill Simpson, this time uh, under the guise of Johnny Blue Skies, his new album, uh, Passage du Désir, you know, or whatever. I, I'm not French, uh, so I apologize. <laughs> it's better than I would have pronounced it. So. Yeah, <laughs> I, I I did a, 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 you know, intro to French and middle school and that's you know that's the extent of it so my apologies but anyway uh yeah if you're a Sturgill Simpson fan it's been a while since we've heard from him he had some uh some vocal issues uh taking some time off to live a little life to be uh you know in a Marty Scorsese movie um and you know th- this album kind of just sprung up on me and really you know, the one I've enjoyed the most in a couple of albums, and I like all of his records, it just goes back to uh, his roots of kind of reinventing what you think, quote unquote, country music can be. Um, and just a, a really psychedelic experience. Uh, the other one uh, let's talk about uh, is uh, Kiosmos or Cosmos 2, uh, Isolated Duo. Uh Saw the good reviews, hadn't gotten to it. Carl gave me the nudge and said, uh, you know, you need to get into this. And, uh, you know, doing the research on this, I was just really uh, surprised. I used to listen to uh, one of their members, Olafur Arnold's. Uh, I remember in high school when I was really getting into Sierra Rose and trying to find the next steps in Icelandic music, you know, however small that scene was. And really got into his work and somehow missed the debut of, uh, of Chiasmos. And uh, so coming in on Chiasmos 2, just uh, really lovely ambient electronic music. Definitely, you know, it's, it's not challenging at all, but in the, in the July heat, it's the kind of thing I'm looking for. Uh, just transporting you somewhere else. And then uh, the third album I wanted to talk about real quick, because we're going to talk about uh, Denzel Curry's uh, new record, another hip hop record from my favorites, uh, MC Open Mike Eagle, his new project, Previous Industries, uh, with him and Video Dave and Still Rift. Just uh, another fun project by him and still my, my favorite you know, lyricist in my, my limited hip hop arsenal and, uh, fun, fun beats, 
So, you know, if you're looking for some left field hip hop, that's a great record there. How about you? Fantastic. Yeah, I mean, definitely that uh, Chiasmos record. I, I've not got it down. I've actually gone for three gigs, but if I was going for an album this month, that would be right up there. Just as you say, first rate electronic record, one you can just, you know, stick your headphones on, lose yourself in. Uh, really fantastic. Um, Stir Girl, I still need to check out. I, it, it's one of those where we're recording this so late in August. I'm trying to remember if I've listened to that uh, Stir Girl record or not. <laughs> it's, yeah, I might have listened to it at the start of August and I've just forgotten it, but uh, definitely the Open Mic Eagle one as well. I need to check out. So definitely be hitting those up. But yeah, for me, like I said, there was a couple of albums I enjoyed in July. Um, but I went for free gigs as the highlights this month. So July for me started with a, a mini festival. My sister lives in the Crystal Palace in London. And every summer they have like this uh, summer concert series in various parts of Crystal Palace Park. Um, and up until now, the date and, and the bands haven't quite worked out uh, in terms of like getting me down there. But this time around they had the National on the Friday block party on the Sunday, same weekend. So that was a good excuse to, you know, go spend some time with family, catch up, you know, two of my favorite bands, um, catch them um, play the same weekend. Uh, really nice layout for the shows. It's held in this spot uh, in Crystal Palace Park called the Italian Terraces. So you've got these, it's quite high up. You've got these lovely scenic views across London and it's kind of got like the main floor, which is like like an arena set up. And then if you go up the actual Italian terrace steps, you've got like a balcony where you have people like sat out with picnic blankets, watching the acts and um, food stalls, bars everywhere too. So it was like a really nice setup that they had. Um, National, I won't talk about too much because it wasn't too dissimilar to what I saw from them in Porto uh, a month earlier, but... Um, I will say there was a few more deep cuts this time around. They played Cherry Tree, Little Pink Rabbits, which um, if I have heard them before, it's very rarely you get to hear them play those those tracks. Yeah, cool. um, so yeah, it was cool to hear those ones in there. Um, if I'm being honest, I think the port I set did edge it for me. Um, I, th I think it, I was trying to work out were they better or was I just more drunk? I don't know, but <laughs> it was yeah. Like, yeah, it's one of those. Uh, uh, yeah, it's still a great performance. It was on sea breeze. Yeah, that's <laughs> it. The beach, yeah, that's what it was. Yeah, uh, but yeah, uh, what I did do is I achieved a lifelong dream of singing Mister Mister November with Matt Big in uh, literally in my face yes. uh, in my arms and it was just like surreal just an incredible moment um there was so many the annoying thing was there were so many people around me filming it and i've scoured the internet trying to find the footage and i've still yet to find it so um that was annoying just because i wanted to re relive that moment but um very fantastic uh to maybe get i'll surprise you and come out as an official release or something yeah that's what i mean <laughs> get the footage on there somewhere um, Which one did you uh, get the new T-shirt at? Oh yeah, so this is from Crystal Palace. Uh, okay, so yeah, I got this one there, but it does also have the Porto date on the back. So all right, <laughs> it covers both bases. It's two for one. Yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, that was fantastic, and I should also mention um, Kevin Morby was brought into uh, another big reason why we box, and you know that was one artist Kylie that you obviously introduced me to, and forever grateful for that um great to catch him again um fantastic did all the this is the photograph stuff and um, and yeah just really good so that was uh the national on the friday then on the sunday it was block party celebrating their 20th anniversary which obviously makes me feel so old uh, <laughs> the, uh yeah celebrated that I, I went to the uh the zero year old tour i went to that <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Because it seems like last week. <laughs> uh, it's, it's like, where's the last 20 years gone? But yeah, um, but yeah great lineup supporting. Um, support, and then they have the Mysterines. Who, for, I mean, for me, they were slightly underwhelming, um, especially compared to the Hives and Friendly Fires. 
who were both just fantastic, really brought the party energy, got everyone suitably warmed up. Um, yeah, really great to catch those two. Um, but yeah, you could tell, you could definitely tell the difference between the block party show and the national show because block party was completely sold out, definitely busier about. Um, but yeah, just a real celebration and career spanning set. Um, played almost the entirety of Silent Alarm, um, all the singles throughout their career as well. Um, even played Skeleton and One More Chance, which they'd obviously stopped playing for a few years. So as soon as that guitar riff for Skeleton kicked in, I lost my head. It was just like fantastic to hear that song again. Um, and fantastic day and night. But yeah, to top it off... Um, completely out of the blue, went to get a drink in the VIP bar and ran into Yanis Philippakis from Foles, who, along with, you know, Hayden for Tim, Tim Booth from James, probably Kelly Okariki from Block Party as well. He's he's like up there as one of my big musical heroes. So it was one of those where I didn't expect to run into him. So it completely caught me off guard. And I ended up getting this, like, I just saw him, said hello, like... Uh, got a selfie with him and it's like the most awkward selfie if you see it I, I go, his eyes are, his eyes are short it's like from an awkward angle um and then i took a picture of obviously Anna with him and it's like perfect it's like yeah you know, like had it in the loop it's like the perfect picture and i was like oh, no, I'm um but yeah really friendly guy and yeah just really cool to share that very very brief moment with him but uh yeah that just capped off that gig for me and then the last one uh so I appreciate it I've gone through. Um those was the the last highlight was uh, the Hotelier over in Dublin. Um another band celebrating an anniversary, ten years of their classic album, Hey Like No Places There. Um they obviously did the big tour, Your Way with uh, Foxy, yeah. uh which at one point, I was looking at flying over there to cut it out because it was like they didn't announce any UK dates. The only date that they announced was um, a festival in Manchester called Outbreak, which, to be fair, like the lineup was fantastic, but it was a lot of bands that I've seen recently. Um, so it was one that I just couldn't couldn't quite justify, you know, the travel, the hotel on top of the ticket, which I think was, I think it was £170 for the if you were doing the weekend. So it it was one of them that, you know, I kind of wrote it off. I'm not going to see the Hotelier this year, but luck would have it. Um, front man Christian Holden got himself engaged. Um, so he basically decided to do a couple of solo shows, travel across across Europe with his wife-to-be, kind of around the, the time of Outbreak Festival. So closest date, uh, was Dublin, which was closer than the US. So <laughs> it was, yeah, like, yeah. So it was more like, okay, let's go for that one. And it fell on a weekend when uh, my partner was, she actually needed to be in Ireland for work as well. So the stars, the stars aligned, so to say. Um, and we managed to go along to that. And yeah, I, th I, th I think it actually worked out better because, you know, at Outbreak, they just played the album in full and that was like their 30 minutes set. Whereas with this one, like, not only did he play pretty much all of Home Like No Places there, I think there was like one or two songs that he missed off. But we also got the songs from Goodness, which for me personally, that, you know, that was my album of the year in 2016. I love that album just as much. Um, there was a couple of fun anecdotes and covers in there, did too. We did like a sped up version of uh, Wonderwall by Oasis, <laughs> which, which was linked to uh, his drummer, like, trying to. We someone uh, <laughs> that boy. Um, did a cover cool, cool of Avril Lavigne's uh, "I'm With You," which I think they did for radio, one of the radio stations at one point, um, which was really good. But yeah, it was it was just one of those, you know, tiny little pub, a band that I have so much admiration for. So it was just a really special sh show to see them in, you know, such an intimate space. And yeah, that was my. <laughs> not quite succinct but yeah three high uh, highlights for this month yeah i mean hotelier i i i still need to see them myself and you mentioned too their uh boxing we we'd uh listen to the new 
new single. That could be a September option there. Exactly. You know, yeah. Trying to figure out September because while July is lean, September is, you know, just about the biggest month. Of the year. Yeah, we, we could easily do two, two or three podcasts, I think. God, yeah. <laughs> still yeah. just coming out in September. Um, but uh, I love the spirit of an eight-minute lead single, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Boxing. <laughs> yeah, definitely check out that Boxing single. Uh, yeah. Video. video great great, great low-budget video. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so that was our monthly highlights. We'll now move on to the five albums. So... And if it's your first time watching the podcast, um, each month we pick five albums. Um, well, we we pick four albums. Then one is chosen by a poll over on, uh, you know, Instagram, Twitter, um, which makes up our block of five. We then discuss them, rank them, and one at the end of the podcast will be named as our album of the month. So kicking us off for July, um, much belatedly, is, uh, yeah, King of the Mischievous South, Volume 2, by Denzel Curry. And Kylie, this was your pick this month, so why don't you kick us off? Sure, yeah. I had mentioned in the uh, earlier months' highlights, you know, Open Mike Eagle and my my limited arsenal of, you know, must-hear hip-hop Um people that I have and Denzel Curry is one of those um you know I I really came in with uh Zoo went back to Taboo and uh you know enjoyed Unlocked with Kenny Beats all the iterations of that um I I don't think I've ever seen an album released so many times <laughs> after that oh um, I'd all be so great as well like it's yeah the- version 1.5 like it's jackass with deleted scenes or something like that um but yeah anyway and then 2022 uh melt my eyes see your future i just as much as i've loved all of his work that was a top 10 record for me that year um great beats great features so you know was was looking forward to uh king of the mischievous south part two um and overall i've really enjoyed this this album too, I, I guess we should call it, it's it's a mixtape. And yeah. for as much as uh, I could never figure out what a mixtape and an album is anymore, this one definitely uh, has a mixtape feel. Um, you know, it's, it's not necessarily very cohesive, kind of all over the place. You know, I was looking at the production credits. I feel like, you know, there's like 20 producers listed on this thing and just a load of features. Um, Pretty much every song has features from, you know, people you're familiar with to, you know, introducing me to some new, some new MC, MC. So, um, yeah, I think w- where I really, um, enjoyed this album was, uh, in the samples and like really, really getting into where, you know, these were coming from. Cause, you know, Denzel Curry's from Miami, but kind of leaning into the the Memphis hip hop sound, trying to figure out what exactly that means, you know? And um, so, so I dug into like ultra shit, which is for, I guess, you know, there's an intro, but that's really the opening track here. Mm-hmm. Um, and it just had this cool, almost vaporwave uh, sample to it. And uh, let's see, it was a, uh, Low key featuring NDB, which was like a Memphis underground hip hop group back in the early nineties. And, uh, their song on that devil shit is where this song comes from. And, you know, when you go back and listen to like the original version, it's just like Denzel and, uh, Keen, just, you know, amped up the beats and the bass, but the melody of it's still there, which is actually a sample of black butterfly by Denise Williams from 1984. So, just you know, this, this is one of those albums that it it really is the beats that pull me in, and then I end up. Uh, for anyone out there that loves this stuff, who sampled dot com is really handy for this because um, I I do not know this stuff off the top of my head. Um, Hot one as well uh, has another old Memphis uh, underground hip hop uh, group, Jim uh, Jimison Families. Fear No Evil, so that one's cool. 
Uh, and then, you know, so some folks I wasn't familiar with, like uh, that Mexican OT on Black Flag Freestyle. Um, I guess he's a, a Texas uh, rapper that, you know, starting to dig back into his stuff and really enjoying it. Uh, you know, G's up, you get two chains, which, you know, I think he always lends some good, you know, mainstream cred to, you know, some otherwise obscure projects. <laughs> uh, another sample I really enjoy is on uh, Sked, which uh, got, you know, NBA Jam. <laughs> like, so much fun when Denzel's just like, you know, spitting right there. Like, hell yeah, NBA Jam, I'm into that. Um, and then, uh, you know, I really like the back half of this record too. Cold Pimps, fun with tight dollar sign, mm -hmm. uh, wish list, ski mask, the slump God. Like there's just, I don't know. It's, uh, I mean, how, how long is this, right? It's 34 minutes, you know, um, the intros, outros, interludes. I've never been really a fan of that, that <laughs> idea. So I could remove those, but otherwise yeah, it's just a really fun um, summer hip hop record. I don't think I like it quite as much as uh, previous industries or the uh, the new Vince Staples record, but and it's definitely I, I don't see it being like on a year end list like Melt My Eyes was. But if you understand it for what it is, it's a it's a fun mixtape. Then you know it's it's an enjoyable experience. What do you think? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, kind of similar to you, always been a big fan of Denzel's work up until this point, you know, came in slightly earlier on uh, Taboo was the first one, which is still, you know, I love uh, Melt My Eyes and Zoo, but I'd, I'd say Taboo is still like my favorite project. It is, you know, it's it's a rap record with like punk rock energy, which sure. is just, just like right up my street. Um but yeah, like, you know, everything he mentions, you know, big fan of the record he did with Kenny Beats. It was kind of like, like you say, that and the multiple versions of that was like the standard, one of the standout hip hop records, I think, of the lockdown years. Um, and then, yeah, Melt My Eyes as well. Was it, you know, it wasn't quite into my top 10 like it was your, yours, but certainly made it into the top 50. And he's kind of one of those that, you know, I went into this for high expectations. He's he's one of those artists that just doesn't miss. And I think for the most part, that's the case with this one. It, like you say, it's just another solid project from him. Um, I'd say my caveat for it is, like you said, he, you know, he, he's, he has set a high bar for himself. And I'm not sure this one, because it is a big state, you know, it doesn't quite hit that high mark that he's set for himself. Um Obviously, a lot more collaborations this time around, which I'm not sure if that's one of the reasons why, you know, I'm, I'm not clicking with it quite like the others. But, you know, the fact that it doesn't feel like a straight Denzel album in that sense. But, um, you know, you mentioned Vince Staples there, but it's also, for me, you know, it's a shame this came out at the same time as um, the JPEG Mafia record, which... Out of the two, you know, that is the one I find myself returning to. Denzel is actually on there as well. So it's, yeah. <laughs> and and it, it kind of ha it has that same vibe as tat uh, Taboo. So it's, you know, it's it's one of them where it almost feels more like a Denzel project than this one does at times. But uh, <laughs> sure. Yeah. I can hear that. Yeah. But, um, but no, I mean, all, all that said, though, you know, like you say, 35 minutes. A lot of great tracks on here. It doesn't overstay its welcome. Um, ultra shit and set it. I think strong start. Like you say, fantastic beats. Great flow. You know, the one with two chains, G's up. Just really minor yeah, with that. Ridiculous. It's yeah. just it's just a great summer, summer hip-hop track that you can bounce along to. Get it on in the car. And, <laughs> you know, it's just fantastic. Um uh, Sked as well, you mentioned. Again, just super catchy. You know, Ty Dollar Sign, excellent feature as always on um, Cole Pin. Um, and that's, uh, you know, similar to you, that's probably the highlights for me. And, um, you know, you mentioned the ones in the back end, like Wishlist and um, is it Hoodlums at the end, which I, th I, I, th I think they're fine. But, you know, 
definitely, I think it's Hudlins where, you know, there's some impressive bars on that one, especially. But yeah, it's, it's one of them where I just don't find myself vibing maybe with them as much as the earlier cuts in the in the mixtape. But yeah, I, th- I, th- I, think, I think for me, this is one that in terms of, in terms of Denzel's own catalog, it's maybe on the weaker end, but in terms of, you know, hip hop records that we've had in 2024, it's still probably really quite, quite yeah. up the higher end, um, like all his albums are. So for me, you know, still worth checking out. Um, but yeah, maybe, maybe not his best. Um, obviously Andrew is not on the, the pod this month, but thankfully he is with us in spirit. So, uh, he <laughs> sells, yeah, <laughs> he's, yeah, he said for his, uh, is a uh, elevator lift kind of pitch for these albums. So uh, on the Denzel record, he said, found it very moody, intriguing beats, not much in the way of depth in the lyrics, which, yeah, I can agree with that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, he still found it a nice, cohesive pitch of songs. So I, th- I think we're kind of all on the same page with that one where, you know, enjoyed it, but maybe, you know, wanted a little bit more out of uh, Denzel on this one, so... He's just that good. He is that good, yeah. <laughs> he's, he's ruined it for himself. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, that was our first record, in the Mischievous South Volume 2 by Denzel Curry. We're now going to move on to album number two, which is Django's High by Future Utopia. The reason I picked it is... Uh, this, this band kind of came to me in a, in a strange way. Um, I saw them on the Get Together festival lineup earlier this year. It was a festival I did in Sheffield, which is kind of like a new music festival. I uh, saw them on there. I listened to a couple of their singles as I was going through like the lineup, which I typically do. Um, and I must have enjoyed a couple of their singles at the time. However, it was it was a band that I didn't catch on the day due to clashes and you know, the time of the day that they were on. So when it, when I was looking at July picks, you know, I, I saw that they had the, this album coming out. So I thought, you know, I did catch them at Get Together, but this might maybe a good way to dive into their music a bit more should it end up winning the poll. So it was one of them that, to be honest, wasn't one that I expected to win, given that it was, you know, a fairly unknown record. Um and considering, you know, some of the others, I can't remember what else we had on the poll, but I, I know definitely the ones that it was up against, it seemed like the outsider, but, you know, the people spoke and it somehow snuck in there. And, um, yeah, we've had um, the pleasure of listening to this uh, album this month. Um, and, yeah, I'll, I'll kind of start with the background. So Future Utopia is the solo project of producer Fraser T. Smith which is maybe not someone um, that I certainly was aware of his name, but when you start digging into his work, you know, it's certainly much more familiar. He's worked with the likes of Stormzy, Dave, Sabian, Adele, Kano, all these heavyweight kind of pop and hip-hop artists, um, loads of others as well. And from what I gather, Future Utopia's first record, um, which was titled 12 Questions, it's not one that I've um, listened to you, but was from what I got to go back to it after the <laughs> <laughs> it was one of them that, um, yeah, from, from the surface of it, it looked very much like a producer's record. He was like the curator working with a load of collaborators on the tracks. You know, Arlo Parks was on there, Koji Radical gets Kano, Tom Grutter. Um, so although it was like the first solo project under the future utopia name it was still more or less him working from what i can gather primarily as a producer so with jando's high this is very this very much feels like almost like his debut solo project you know it's his it's his vocals this time around um he's not just the producer this time you know there's no place to hide so to speak and sadly, yeah, I think I think it does suffer as a as a result of that. Um, you know that there are a couple of fun moments here. You know, Fra- Fraser sort of said that he wanted to make a psychedelic spaghetti western with this one, 
I think the opening track, looking for a way out, is probably the closest he gets to achieving that. Um, you know, it's got a you know quite a cool guitar groove running through it. Um, I think I think it's a fairly decent opener. Um, I also quite like the last track, set, uh, set in with Emin. Um, similar kind of melody. Um, again, quite a cool guitar groove running through it. But yeah, I mean, unfortunately, other than those two, this just feels... It's 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 funny because we're all going to Andrew's notes as well. Um, but yeah, this just feels like a pale imitation, I would say, of other great psych records we've had. Not just this year, but in the last few years as well. Um, I don't think Fraser's vocals... Are the last <laughs> decade. The last decade, yeah. It's like... Uh, <laughs> It's yeah. It's I don't I don't think Fraser's vocals are strong enough. I think at times it feels like, you know, the production on this thing. It's almost like it's purposely made overwhelming to drown out, you know, the flaws in his vocal work. That's how it feels when you're listening to it. And you know, I, I don't think it's necessarily that these are bad songs, but all of it just seems to come and go without leaving for me, any impact at all, which I think is somehow actually worse than if it was, you know, this is straight bad. <laughs> but, um, yeah, you listen to, you know, Interplanetary Signs or Django's House, and, yeah, it just feels a bit like Taming Part of the Cosplay at times. Um, I know Serge from Kasabian produced some of it too, which you can definitely hear, you know, some of Kasabian's more psychedelic stuff. You can hear that coming through as well. But again, you know, comparing it to Team and Parlor, comparing it to some of Kasabian's stuff, it just it just doesn't hit the right notes for me. So, yeah, this one was a pass. Um, I think if you wanted to listen to a fun psychedelic record along these lines, you know, I would go back to the Pond record from last month that we reviewed, or you know, the MGMT record from earlier this year. Um, yeah, definitely that. I'd, yeah, I, I, I think in terms of the ones that we've had, like you say, not just in the last decade, but even like the last few months, I don't think this is uh, one that can quite match up to that standard. So it's not one that I find myself reaching for, uh, unfortunately. But how did you get on with uh, Django's High? Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I ended up listening to um, the new, it didn't make my month highlights, but Vertigo, the new Wand album. Mm. Um, who kind of have typically rolled in that Tame Impala lane. Uh, they also had a new record last last month that, you know, I, I listened to a few times, which is more than I can say for for this one. I just, um, this is, uh, for me, like the most unimaginative uh, album I've heard this year. Um, I've definitely heard uh ones that were uh I, I guess more boring or <laughs> didn't do absolutely anything um and as he said i do appreciate you know this is a producer's album he is trying to do a lot at once here but i just i cannot um shake that every one of these songs has you know either uh grung bin or tame impala very very influenced uh melodies and mm -hmm. vocal practices and i just uh both of those those groups uh, i know you know tame paul is one guy um <laughs> i'm tired of that meme um but yeah both those both those groups just uh are absolutely not doing anything for me anymore uh you know tame and paula moving on to the minions three soundtrack or whatever um the dungeons and dragons movie which was bad but you know tame and paula doing the opening credits i just you know i digress this isn't future I'm utopia to, but i'm trying to picture that you know the the dungeons yeah. and dragons visuals with that sound yes yeah it's not quite much you know <laughs> it, yeah it's 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 uh it's how it always sounds anyway um <laughs> You know, I, I kind of rag on both of those bands. I know, especially around here, Karam Ben, the last couple of years, it's just really, everyone loves them, so I just kind of lay low on this. But uh, 
that that is a band that's just done the same thing for like five albums now and um to have future utopia come and say well here it is again <laughs> um here's here's a lonerism again 10 years later it's just it's it's late to the party it feels like a you know a a disco album coming out in the mid 80s or something <laughs> like that like we've been there we've moved on so anyway yeah when it's when it's this um i agree with you when it's this unimaginative it's almost worse than just um I, I guess I'll, I'll save this for like one of the next albums. It's 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 worse than when it's just straight up bad. You know? Yeah. So Interesting. anyway, yeah, I think the three of us, you could have nominated Cassandra Jenkins, but yeah, oh, that was my bad. Yeah, we got this. I we all we all do it. <laughs> yeah, I could only apologize to yourself and Andrew for that one. <laughs> uh, but, um, yeah. Speaking of Andrew, so he sent through his notes for this one, and uh, pretty much the same, the same as us. So slick, ultra produced, it's superficial sounding, not engaging at all. Vocals poor, lyrics minimalist. Most songs sound the same. Uh, you're gonna have to help me pronounce this one. I know you just said it, Kruangbin. Kruangbin. Yeah. Um, and Tame Impala, but way worse. So <laughs> <laughs> he's. You know, future utopia maybe maybe sticks to the production. It's maybe the the message there. But yeah, you know, he's he's obviously got this passion project. He's got it out of his uh, system, and thankfully we don't have to listen to it anymore. So <laughs> um, that was uh, yeah, Django's High by Future uh, Utopia, and we'll now move on to the third album, which is As Above. So Below by Highly Suspect. And this was Andrew's pick for the month. So I might just start with, uh, I'll start with his notes um, because this was the one that he picked. Um, He's obviously the most familiar with Highly Suspect. He put a fun classic rock throwback, generic lyrics, not Highly Suspect's finest, but perfectly passable all the same first half of the album better than the second half. So it sounds like, you know, he enjoyed it without being blown away by it. So where did you land on this one, Kylie? Um, I hate this record. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, two for two. Yeah. Look, just from the top down, I, I'm always talking labels and... And uh, I'm I'm a big label guy, and that's the first thing I'm going to look at when you know when something comes up. And um, Roadrunner Records, since I can remember, has always been that's not my kind of thing, you know. So I I don't have any experience with Highly Suspect before this, um, and it's understandable why I I know that there's a uh, a huge audience for this kind of music, you know, and I, I look through like the similar artists and it's Chevelle, it's either, um, shine down three days, grace, like stone <laughs> sour. It's just never, it's never been my thing. Yeah. Um, and just this, my, my first experience with, uh, these guys, this is just more, uh, butt rock for, jumping out of a helicopter you know this is uh it it does absolutely nothing for me the the riffs i guess are just a lot of why i guess modern quote unquote heavy rock is not my thing um it, it, in a weird way kind of reminds me of like where the foo fighters have been in the last mm. you know however many years it just it, it doesn't do anything for me and then to to top it off, these are uh, you know I I didn't write them down, but every song consistently has some lyric at least once that makes me just go, "Holy shit, that's the worst thing I've ever heard." You know? <laughs> the next song um, does the same. It, it's also entirely too long. Um, the first song is six and a half minutes, and I love long songs. I'm 
you know, for better or worse, a deadhead. I love good jams, but the that first song, every time I put it on, it's like at the four minute mark. I'm just like, oh my god, there's so still <laughs> another two and a half minutes to this. Uh, Melatonia, that's seven and a half minutes. Just like the the last couple of songs, just drag like crazy. Um, I will say the the one compliment that I had on it uh, is I thought. Despite the lyrics, the lyrics were awful, but Mexico is kind of a fun, uh, groovy little tune and really love the um, organ work on there. I wanted to credit whoever does that, but I, when I was looking at the band, four of them were credited for playing synthesizers. So I don't know who's doing that, um, but I kind of like that. That root sound works a little bit on that track. But um, yeah, this is this is one that, we we are taping this so late and I could not get into it through July. And this last week I have tried going into it like three more times, just wanting to find something. <laughs> and it's just, it's awful. It's not my thing. So yeah. if you're into this, we're, we're just on different pages. <laughs> so Roadrunner Records, what you're saying is their output is highly suspect. In more ways than one. <laughs> yes, very much. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, I mean, from my side, you know, highly suspect. I have. I've, I've listened to them very briefly previously. Remember checking out there. I didn't note down any of the lyrics, but hopefully, some of these Soren album titles will give you an idea of what's on this album. So the the, the only highly suspect. Uh, records that I checked out previously is their awfully titled album, The Boy Who Died Wolf, um, a few years <laughs> back. Uh, which, you know, it's, I enjoyed it without being captivated by it, I would say. And I think because of that, I had quite low expectations going into this one. And to be honest, I think I'm more aligned with Andrew, where I've actually come out, enjoyed it maybe more than I expected to. 100% agree on the negative sides. I think it's too long. The lyrics are, as you say, very corny, very cliched. More than one occasion, I found myself cringing so hard my skin was crawling. Um, but, you know, outside of that, if I'm kind of leaving my, you know, <laughs> leaving my snobbery at like the headphones door, so to speak. Um, you know, the vocal performances from Johnny Stevens, I think are decent. You know, he's got that classic rock and roll gravelly voice going on. And I think for the most part, it kind of works for the for the style that they're doing. Um, but yeah, I, I, think, I think the star of the show for me here is, is the guitar work. Um, you know, for me, there's no denying that this thing shreds. Um, even on the songs where I'm not completely won over, like, again, awful title, Champagne at Our Funeral, and another awful title, Run For Your Death. <laughs> I mean, there is at least a solid riff, I think, on those songs that I can sing my teeth into, and, you know, it leaves me feeling somewhat impressed. So, you know, in terms of highlights, Summertime Voodoo, I know you're not a fan of that song, I think that was a fairly fun opener, you know, it does, I agree, it does take its time, but I quite, I quite enjoyed that. I think it eventually gets to some interesting places sonically as it goes along. Uh, Blue Eyed Devil, Plastic Boxes, I think, of, you know, five rock songs. Um, again, it's the guitar work that stands out. Melatonia, you know, the emo in me is digging that, you know, a bit more of a somber moment on the record. Um and then I think my favorite two tracks are the two right at the end, 8th of October and Mickey 2. So where um, Andrew said he preferred the first half, you know, those two at the end, you know, 8th of October is like this big epic. And then Mickey 2 is like really kind of understated compared to the other tracks on the album. It's all, almost veers a bit into Radiohead uh, territory. So I think that's a, like a nice one-two combo to, to close the record. But... Yeah, not too much more to say about it, really. Like it's like you say, it, it is a flawed project. It's ultimately not a record that, you know, I'm going to be returning to beyond this or 
featured on my year end list, but I think in a in a quiet July month, I've had an an enjoyable time with this album. Um, again, more more than I was expecting to. So I think uh, we'll leave that one at that. So kind of a mixed bag on highly suspect. Um, or can, can I read a lyric really quick? Cause yeah, go for it. Yeah. Um, so this is off my favorite song on the album. Uh, Mexico. I got a stormtrooper backpack, motorcycle ready to groove, and I can't never let nobody come and fuck up all my heavenly flow. Won't stop till I'm down till I'm sipping a mojito down in Mexico. Let's go, let's go, bring it down now. <laughs> I mean, where's the Pulitzer Prize? I don't know, let's get it. <laughs> These guys are due. No, I mean that's yeah. Yeah, so <laughs> mojitos, are, mojitos are a pain in the ass for bartenders to make, <laughs> by the way. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Although he uh, always, yeah, the idea <laughs> is better than the reality. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll leave uh, we'll leave highly suspect there. Mojito making. Um and we're moving swiftly on to uh harmonics, which was my pick, and it's by the mighty Joe Goddard. So yeah, this new one from Joey G, quite a uh, certainly my favorite electronic band, but one of my favorite bands as well, Hot Chip. Um, you know, really enjoyed his last solo project as well, Electric Lines, that came out a few years ago. And it was one of those where, you know, I just looked at the guest list on this one, a Bibio Sound Machine, Alexis Taylor also a hot chip, my guy Hayden Ford. So it was it was a bit of a no-brainer pick for me this month. And I, th- I think it's an album that, you know, kind of what I was expecting on paper, it basically lives up to that billing. I think it's a great uh electronic project tailor made for the summer um and you just get like a really great mix of songs on here you know opens on one of the singles moments die which could easily be just be a hot chip song just a really catchy little synth pop track great vocals from uh brooklyn singer barry who yeah barry that's a great yeah you get great combo there guest stars on that and yeah, that kind of sets a high bar straight away from me. And then, you know, next up, you've got Progress, which is the track with a BBO sound machine. And it kind of keeps the level right there. You know, the vocals from Eno Williams, you know, we, we spoke about the BBO sound machine records a couple of months back. Um, and particularly, yeah, her vocal performances. But again, just sublime. You know, those cries that she kind of does on the chorus and then the horns come in. You know, I think it's one of those that if it wasn't on this album, you could happily slot it into that Abibio Sound Machine record from earlier on in the year. Um, Just absolutely fantastic. Um, If you're a fan of, you know, Joe Goddard and then I think you'll be very happy with that collaboration. Destiny is maybe where it slightly comes down for me after that. I think it's a very strong one, two to start. Destiny is one that just borders a bit too much on Eurovision vibes for me. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's similar to that. Uh, I can't remember the, which Caroline Polachek song it was, but I mentioned the similar thing, but it's just where it's got the, you know, that Eurovision DNA about it, um, which I, it's, a, it's a fine track, but yeah, it's not. It's not one that I find myself drawn to as much, but thankfully what what follows is a song that's quickly becoming one of my songs of the summer, which is New World Flow, which it's one of those that just every time it comes on, I'm not skipping it. It's just fantastic. Such a jubilant, joyous chorus. You know, it builds on the verses and then it just unleashes this like flash flood of color on the chorus um milan based singer songwriter furious is the person who guest vocals on this and he's got this really soulful voice just 
stu- stupendous um, vocal performance from him. So yeah, that's that's about I'll down my highlight that song. Uh, absolutely love it. Um, and then it again, it just really you got this real kind of like so soulful dance tune, and then he Joe Goddard just flips the switch again. And you've got Love's Out of Fashion, which has UK rapper. I'm not sure how to pronounce this. It's either Orange or Orangey. <laughs> orange. Or, or Orange, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, um, We're fluent in French around here. Yeah. It's spelled O R A N J E. So you make up your minds how, how we should be pronouncing that one. Um, but yeah, just just another change of pace again. And I think that's. That's what I say about this record. It almost, it almost feels like a really well curated playlist. You know, every song kind of has a similar vibe, but also has its own unique flavor. Like it goes between, you know, these dance tunes, these synth pop tracks, this, you know, hip hop track that comes along, and it's just, a, it's just a really fun project that, you know, I find myself because it, because of the nature of it, I just find myself coming back to it. Um, Plenty of other highlights in the back half. Obviously, love the track with Hayden. Um, they had they had a great standalone collaboration a few years back called Unknown Song, which this one's as good as that one for me. I would love to see them do like a full EP or an album together down the road. That would be a bit of a dream come true to see to see that. Definitely based off the two collaborations they've done to, so far. I think that'll be great. Um other ones I enjoyed, Ghosts with Tom McFarland of Jungle. Um, I think that's great as well. It's a more it's more of a subdued track compared to some of the others on here, but again, um, really soulful vocals on that one. Um and then the one right at the end really loved the track with jazz musician um uh, Alabaster uh, Diplum or Diplume. I'm not sure how you <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna say it's Diplume and not Diplum. <laughs> but um, um but yeah, really love that track at the end of the record. I think it's a nice way to round it off. Um mm. again, some good hauls uh, kind of coming through on on that one. And I think yeah, everything else that I've not mentioned on here for me is between good and great. I think even the tracks where it is just Joe on his own, like Follow You, On My Mind. I think between all the awesome collaborations, there's some really nice like solo moments in there as well, which are just like these chilled out kind of ambient electronic tracks. Um, some really cool like vocoder and um, vocal work on those as well. So yeah, big fan of this one. I think it's... For me, it's a perfect July record, not too demanding or taxing, really eclectic sonically. Like I say, it mixes up the style track to track. And it's like I say, it's got that like well crafted summer playlist feel to it. So um I think over the last month, certainly in July, it's the one that I found myself coming back to the most. So big thumbs up from me. What did you uh, what did you make of this one, Kylie? Yeah, likewise, big thumbs up for me. I don't know whether we, I know I didn't intend to have, you know, so many uh, quote unquote mixtapes and feature heavy <laughs> records this month, but this is the one that for me, uh, Joe Goddard really ties it together. And as you say, it, it works as like a really great playlist that has, you know, been been played in every situation for me this last month. It's just, uh, really diverse while, you know, not being, um, overly challenging. And in that, in that way, I, I mean that as a compliment. Um, yeah, same, same background, Hot Chip. It's one of those, uh, one of those bands that, you know, just reminds me of my early twenties and going to the, to the club and dancing to, you know, they're, they're, can't miss hits and I think the I've never had a hot chip record I don't like but I do feel that their last few have been so strong um just really hitting their stride and then uh the work that they did like with the Bibio Sound Machine who you know returns here and when we reviewed their new record, I was saying, you know, I, I kind of missed that hot chip influence that was on the previous record. And 
like here we are back at it with progress and I think it could fit on that new Vivio Sound Machine record, but at the same time, I kind of like that more than anything that yeah, was on that record. Um, and then, you know, just getting into a few of them too, that that opener with Barry, um, uh, a group that I had kind of forgotten about. I think their debut came out pre-pandemic and one of those that I listened to a lot and then, mm-hmm. you know, years happened and I <laughs> hadn't come back, so... I, I enjoyed that enough to uh, add their, their sophomore record that I missed to my uh, listen list. Um, yeah, I really love the Fendia feature. Um, and uh, I, I'm, I'm, I like all of it. I like all the, the ambient tracks. Um, for me, uh, I kind of, I like the last bit um, where there's, you know, Alexis Taylor and Al Doyle on, on mountains. And I really like, uh ghosts with the with the jungle feature um and then the one i don't know how to pronounce if it's fale uh nioke mm-hmm. you know getting that that afro groove on miles away um you know it's it's diverse but cohesive and mm-hmm. uh you know it's especially against the the list that we had this month um it, it's an easy favor for me, but I think, you know, if you throw it on another month, it's probably going to be finishing uh, towards the top for that too. So yeah, I just so glad that, you know, whether it's hot chip as a whole or Joe working on his own or, uh, you know, Alexis Taylor's solo work, they just don't say, for me, they don't seem to miss and they just get stronger with age. It's awesome. I percent agree with that. Yeah. It's, it's, like you say, it's it's one of those records, like real real brave mix of stuff, but then Joe's just there to tie it all together, so it works as a as a whole as is, well. This is how you do a producer's album, right? Yeah, like this is this is the exact opposite of Future yeah. Utopia, big time. So that's what we thought. Let's go over to Andrew, and I think he had pretty pretty much the same. I don't think he maybe enjoyed it as much as us. He said, uh, generally decent club and dance tunes without necessarily being an absorbing listen. Summon, which is the track with Hayden Thorpe, that was the highlight for Andrew, but he did know that it had a uh, nice variety to the record as well, um, which we're always going to appreciate on the, on the pod. So, in the day, we'll get Andrew to really love an electronic record. Yeah, we just need to find the right one. Yeah, we're finding it. Yeah, <laughs> maybe if it's got like a rock, <laughs> yeah, in there as well. That'll be the one to win it over. But we'll get there. Um, so the speaking of rock riffs, uh, the last record I can't believe we're on the last record already. Um, is Heavy Jelly by soft play and this was one that was picked by Matthew McGlister of Blinded by the friend of the podcast um so yeah I'll kick us off with this one I think I think of the three of us initially I think I was the one that was quite looking forward to hearing this one um soft play for those that don't know formerly known as slaves uh if you want to know about the kind of name change there ask bob bob villain is all i'll say about that one and um, <laughs> but yeah it was the, it was one of those that one of those bands that i was never massively massively into them but did enjoy their debut record and always had a great time whenever i caught them live and um, i remember one time in particular i think it was the first time i saw them was at live at leeds which is like an inner city you know, venue to venue, um, festival, one day festival, um, went along to catch them there. Um, first time you actually, them, obviously full on, you know, just absolutely crazy. Le- as we're leaving the venue, I see this guy emerge out of the mosh pit shirtless with what looks like a broken nose, like blood down his face. <laughs> and, but at the same time, just like the biggest smile. Like he was absolutely buzzing, so I think I think that kind of sums them up. That visual kind of sums them up per, 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 perfectly. It's um, 
you know, it's ugly music, but it's also a lot of fun. Um, so yeah, I think I think I think the main reason I was quite excited is because I really enjoyed the singles leading into this one. You know, it is a bit of a comeback record. Um, I can't I can't remember off the top of my head. I should have noted down when their last record was, but I know it's twenty eighteen. Twenty eighteen, yeah. So six years ago now. Um and you know, so it's definitely a comeback record. And I think Punk's Dead, which they released last year, was just like the a fantastic comeback single. You know, it established their new identity whilst at the same time trolling everyone that gave them grief over the name change by yeah, just impersonating um all these people that were yeah, upset with them for why why'd you change your name? Uh, all this kind of stuff. But um yeah, really great track. Fun little cameo from Robbie Williams on there too. Uh, which I think the girl is, is dead. Yeah, that's it. It just <laughs> it just adds to the whole lore of the song, just throwing him on there. I think it's really great. Um so yeah, big fan of that track. Mirror Muscles. Uh, I really rate it as well. Love the riff on there. It's very like almost new metal, like the sound of it. And I think it's you know, again, it's like a sharp commentary on people's like fasc- fascination with bodybuilding. It's even got the that amazing Arnold Schwarzenegger sample on there of the pump, the pump, <laughs> um, running through it, which I, yeah, again, I love. Um, but yeah, so as much as I love those two, it was the single and um, everything and nothing was the one that I really took to. Obviously, a very different song for them and uh, sonically it's based around you know a mandolin uh lyrically sees them quite open quite vulnerable it's you know the two of them talking about the death of their friend and the grief that came with that and i think it's i don't know it's something about the way that they describe you know how they were feeling at a time it's just one of those songs that knocks me for six um, certainly the first time I heard it um, and it's, it's only you know grown on me more that the more times that I've spun it I saw them perform it at Glastonbury when I was watching Glastonbury on TV and that was like that was one of the moments across the weekend where it was just like yeah really powerful uh, to see them perform that and obviously what the song means to them as well but yeah so for me that I mean those three singles kind of set a high bar going into this uh, for me. Um, and I think I'm coming away with those three tracks are still my favourites on here. That said, I think there are some other fun moments on here too. Act Violently, which was the one of the latest single releases. Um, I think that's just a great pure punk track. Very catchy. I love the, again, a great sample of the, hey, I'm walking here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Roots through, uh, through that song. Um, Isaac is typing, I think was the single that they released post-album. Again, a similar story. Fantastic riff, riffs. Typically hard hit vocal performance. Um, and yeah, other than the singles, really enjoy the sub-two-minute tracks. Bin Juice Disaster. <laughs> Yeah, I love which, that. One. Which is just, yeah, great punk fair. Just, yeah, let's make a two minute track about spilling bin juice on the kitchen floor. <laughs> and uh, John Wick as well, just stupid, dumb fun. Um, and yeah, uh, the other one that I really dug as well was The Mushroom and the Swan, just again, classic punk fair. Um, so yeah, I think I came away, like, this is what I think overall, I think the. The highs for me are high, but it's probably one that I'll dip back into rather than playing the whole thing front to back. I'm not sure if I'm just getting old, but <laughs> it's one of those where, you know, it's, it is a short album. It's like sub 30 minutes, but in those sub 30 minutes, there's not much variety. It kind of stays, you know, full volume, super aggressive all the way through up until, you know, you've got that beautiful moment with everything and nothing at the end. I mean, there's a part of me, there's a part of me that wishes there was more moments like that on this, just to break it up a bit. But then I'm not sure if, you know, that song is more impactful because it's the only one 
like that on here. I've, I've still not decided on that, but... And I also appreciate that, it's, you know, it's not very punk to be wanting more songs like that as well. So <laughs> it's probably not what they were going for. But um, I think, yeah, ultimately, if you're a soft play fan, you'll be very happy with this one. I know it's got some good reviews from um, critics as well, saying it's the best. I'm not sure if that's if it's the best for me, but it's definitely their strongest since the debut. And yeah, like I say, I think the singles are fantastic. But I think for my taste, um, you know, going back to that Joe Goddard record, maybe it's just lacking a bit of variety for me. How how about you, Tukari? Yeah, I mean, this is my first experience with Soft Play or Slaves. I remember that they're one of those bands you read about them changing their name and, as, you know, wasn't familiar with them. And that was that. Um but yeah, I, I I'm gonna save the time. Like I agree with you that the singles are um the strongest, uh though I do like Act Violently quite a bit. That one uh gives me like a system of a down kind of yeah. feel to it. Like the rush uh, I enjoyed. Rapid. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, and surge, you know. <laughs> um but yeah, Ben Juice Disaster, Mirror Muscles. I'm with you on all those. And I think the thing that you have to talk about here is everything and nothing, which is mm. um, easily one of the best songs I've heard this year. One of the best songs I've heard in a long time, really like, you know, you listen to as much music as we do. And sometimes it's just, you know, it doesn't, something doesn't hit you uh, more often than not. And that one, um, just to go from these punk tracks to going to uh, not only, you know, the subject matter about the the passing of their friend, um, but really like a, you know, out of time, automatic for the people uh, mm. era REM, uh, kind of like a Counting Crows, you know, real uh, early to mid 90s alternative sound that I don't think of all the nineties revivals, that's like not really something that people are doing right now, but that mandolin, um, it's just a, it's, it's a powerful song. And I, I like that, that Glastonbury performance, you know, is, is only better than what's on the album is fantastic. But that live version, you just, uh, you really feel it. And, um, you know, you're saying, I don't think it's punk to want more of that, but I think like, if these guys really want to be, uh, punk mm. in spirit, then maybe that's a teaser for another album to come. Because the, mm. the 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 fast rapid fire songs are great, but what they get there, the juxtaposition of his uh, you know shout talk vocals with the the mandolin and stuff, it's just. It's it's powerful stuff that yeah only comes along every once in a while. So for that that alone that song alone, like high remarks from me. Yeah, I we just got to mention like the it's one of those where the lyrics on that song, I, it it just it's so raw. You know, white knuckles on the counter in the kitchen. They don't know how hard I'm kicking to keep my head yeah. off. Like it's every time I hear that line, I'm like. God, that's just, it just hits. And like you say, it is, you hear that vocal against the beautiful, like, sound of the mandolin, and it's just, yeah, I'm 100% with you. It's one of the my favourite songs of the year, for sure. And, and yeah, so we're, we're both quite a fan, certainly, of the, the high points on this one. We'll go over to Andrew's notes. Um, he was um, a fan as well. He did that there was some that he didn't agree with. So he put relentless punk tunes, excellent guitar work at times, a few pretty funny songs, particularly Worms on Tarmac. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I obviously mentioned Binge's Disaster and John Wick, but yeah, that's another one that's quite fun as well. Um, not all that deep. Um, some songs seem like pale imitations of idols or Bob Vullen songs who tackle similar subject matter uh, subject matters a lot better. Which, yeah, I could, I could sort of see that. I mean, definitely compared to 
the Bob Villa record earlier this year. I think overall that's a much stronger record. Leagues. Yeah. Run. Yeah. Yeah. But I think, you know, is there a song on that record that's as good as everything or nothing? Maybe not. I don't know. But um, yeah, that's a it's, good question. It, yeah, it's a tough one. But yeah, def- definitely I'd say Humble is the song. Is, um, if you're wanting something similar that's, you know, just got a bit more, just a bit more dynamic, um, a bit more variety in the sound and the influences coming in. That's definitely one to check out. Um, and that brings us to the end of the five. So as we always do at this point, uh, we're now going to score them. So what I'll do is I'll kick off with Andrews. I'll go through mine. And then, Kylie, you can decide what's going to be the July album of the month. So um, I've got Andrews down here. So Andrew had in fifth place Future Utopia. He had in fourth place Highly Suspect. He had in third place Soft Play. In the second place, Joe Goddard. And in first place, his album of the month was Denzel Curry. Um, my ranking, not too dissimilar. Um, I had, I also had Future Utopia in fifth, Highly Suspect in fourth. The top three, I differed slightly. Um, I had Denzel Curry in third, Soft Play in second. I think for me, it is just the highs on Soft Play I found myself coming back to. Um, and then number one for me this month was uh, Joe Goddard. So let me just open the Excel so I can... I've already entered mine and Andrew's, so I'm ahead of the curve. Oh. Uh, so, yeah, hopefully this should total as you read out your results here. Yeah, it's uh, pretty close for me to on, on the same lineup, uh, Future Utopia fit, highly suspect at fourth, I've got soft play at third, um, everything and nothing as number one. On <laughs> uh, uh, and then Denzel Curry at number two and uh, Joe Goddard at number one. Excellent. So as long as Excel has totaled that up correctly, our album of the month for July with a total of an impressive 14 uh, is Harmonics by Joe Goddard. So congratulations to Joey G um, for winning the coveted title. Um, we'll be back again with the August Album of the Month podcast. You might have to help me, Kylie, because I'm trying to remember off the top of my head what albums we're going to be covering. I know it's Wonder Horse, Smashing Pumpkins, Tyco. Fonte- Tyco, Fontaine's okay. DC is... Um, yeah, that's the one I can't think of either. You can, you can cut this out. Uh, yeah. The, the gap. Uh, I'm thinking of some of the September ones we were Oh, Palm Poco. Oh, of course. Yeah. So, Palm Poco. Yeah. 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 There we go. So, yeah. Wonder Horse, Palm Poco, Tyco, Smashing the Pumpkins, Fontaine's DC. Have I already said that? Um, yeah, so I don't know. that's our five albums <laughs> for August. Um, if you want to keep up to with what we're doing, you can follow uh, Five to Nine on uh, Twitter or X and Instagram, Mama Vanyana Records on Instagram, and uh, New Music Central on uh, Instagram as well. Uh, we'll put the links in the descriptions as always. And yeah, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. And we'll be back uh, for another pod in August.